On today's show, have you ever wondered how often your smart speaker just up and decides to start listening to you each and every day? Well, a research team put all the smart speakers to the test, and here's a hint. It's more than 10. In my five things you need to know, find out if the worst is Alexa, Cortana, Google, or Siri. And your work commute got a lot easier. Two tech companies are taking working from home to the next level. Imagine not having to stress about getting stuck in rush hour traffic ever again. In your Tomorrow's Tech Today, soon a 3D version of yourself can show for work. Plus, he dominated the American video game industry, selling millions of games. A key figure in Atari's golden age was designer Howard Scott Warshaw, who created three of the most famous games ever. Whatever happened to Howard and Atari? You'll find out. And finally, the coronavirus outbreak continues to make headlines. What does the spread of the virus mean to your business, your data, and your family? This week's Digital Life Hack shows you the tools to keep informed and keep your digital life and business going. All this and more digital know-how here on Commando. Every day, I look at over 35 different websites to keep up with the latest tech news. And every show, I share only the top five stories you need to know. And we start today with the National Security Agency and its mass surveillance of our phones. Do you remember that? The NSA quietly analyzed metadata on our phone calls and text messages for years, collecting millions or even billions of records a day. The program was officially shut down last year. And when all was said and done, it ended up costing about $100 million. Okay. Maybe that money's worth it if it stops a meaningful number of crimes or terrorist-related activities. Well, a declassified study put together by the Privacy and Civil Liberty Oversight Board was just presented to Congress. According to the New York Times, during all that time and all those records collected, the NSA program resulted in, count them, two unique leads and only one significant investigation. That's $33 million each. If the NSA is that interested in quietly collecting everyone's personal data and getting real results, they should reach out to Facebook, Amazon, or Google. It's a lot cheaper. Number two, swimming with sharks can cost you an arm and a leg. Before joining the popular Shark Tank show about a decade ago, Barbara Corcoran founded a New York City real estate brokerage that she sold in 2001 for $66 million. She's seen a lot and she knows what she's doing, but it doesn't mean she can't be scammed. Corcoran's bookkeeper recently received an email from the reality host assistant asking for a renovation payment. The email looked legit, and since Cochran still invests in real estate, it didn't seem so suspicious. The bookkeeper wired over nearly $400,000. Well, guess what? It wasn't really Cochran's assistant who sent that email. It was a very convincing scammer who created a very similar email address to the actual assistant, but changed one letter. The moral of the story? It doesn't matter who you are or how sophisticated your business is. Anyone can be fooled by today's elaborate phishing scams. Hit commando.com to find out how to spot phishing emails, texts, and other messages. Barbara Cochran once said, finding opportunity is a matter of believing it's there. Words to live by for scammers, too. Number three, your smart speakers are listening a lot. A new study paints a grim picture of how many times your smart speaker listens in per day by accident, thanks to your television. Researchers from Northeastern University and the Imperial College London gathered several popular models of smart speakers, like the Amazon Echo, Google Home Mini, Apple HomePod, and Harman Kardon Invoke. They wanted to find out how and why these speakers mistakenly hear wake words. So they streamed 125 hours of Netflix content from a wide range of categories and measured how many times each speaker was activated by the voices on TV. It's happening more than you think. Your TV could be triggered by smart speakers 19 times a day and recording who knows what. According to the experiment, Apple's Siri and Microsoft's Cortana running on the harm in Cardin were the worst offenders. If there's any good news, it's that when activated, researchers found that these speakers would only record between about 20 to 40 seconds, not long periods of time. It reminds me of the joke. A husband asks his wife how to turn Alexa off. She says, simple, honey. Try walking around the house naked. Number four, you can get more than creepy drivers in an Uber or Lyft. Here's something I never considered, bed bugs. WFAA, the ABC affiliate in Dallas, interviewed a local exterminator who has a mobile service where he burns out the nasty critters by heating homes up to 150 degrees. Now he's using that same method to treat cars in a trend that's increasing. 
This exterminator says he treats five to ten cars for bed bugs a week. That's gross. And it's not just his service. The TV station called around town and other exterminators said the same thing. Now, to be fair, both Orkin and Terminix have Dallas as one of the top ten most buggy cities in America. But you can find bed bugs just about anywhere, which unfortunately includes your ride share. So the next time you have that strange tingly feeling during a ride, it could be heightened awareness about being in a complete stranger's car or it's tiny blood sucking bed bugs making you their next ride share. And finally, number five, Warren Buffett is joining the smartphone revolution. He's the chairman and CEO of Berkshire Hathaway, of course, a holding company that owns Geico, Duracell, Heldsburg Diamonds, and a lot of other household brands. The company also owns roughly 5% of Apple. Money isn't an issue for Buffett. His net worth is about $81 billion. Now at 89 years old, one of Apple's largest shareholders got rid of his flip phone and is the proud owner of a brand new iPhone 11. He can call, text, surf the web, use Apple Pay, and control his smart home. One day, maybe. In an interview, Buffett says that he just uses his iPhone as a phone, but think back when you first made the switch from a dumb phone to a smart one. There's definitely a learning curve, and he'll have to start at the beginning like everyone else. A few years ago, I was voted one of the 100 most influential women in America by Fortune magazine, and I sat next to Warren Buffett after my keynote. I asked him for some stock tips. He laughed. I asked him why he still carried a $20 Samsung flip phone. He said it was because he was old, in fact, so old that in his words, in order to get into women's panties, he had to buy Hanes underwear. Okay, The Kim Commando Show is the nation's largest radio show about all things digital. You can find our show in over 400 top stations from coast to coast and around the globe, I love this, on American Forces Network Radio. That's 177 different countries and every ship at sea gets The Kim Commando Show. And because it's a talk radio show, callers are so important. And manning the calls week after week is our very own Chris Wineland. Hello there, Chris. Hey, how's it going? Good, yes. Good. He finally got a smartphone. I know. That's <laughs> yes. so crazy. My, my grandparents just got a smartphone, too, so I have to still teach them how to text me. I texted them, and then they freaked out. They didn't know how to reply. So. <laughs> Wait till they start getting into emojis. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah, that'll be crazy. I, uh, I just read this. I don't, I don't know if you heard this at all, but uh, new research just proved that hackers can get into the smart cameras of the smart vacuum cleaners. No, wait, yeah, really? It's true. So it turns out the hackers are really just nosy moms in the neighborhood. They're like, did they get a new floor? Who, who got a new floor? <laughs> Honey, they got a new floor. Like, who else is going to want to look at the feet of people? You right, know? exactly. Probably. My mother has one of those. Really? Yeah, she has. The little guy goes around, and, she, and then she'll call me up because she's from Brooklyn. Yeah. She'll be like, hey, Kim, the Roomba, it's not working anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? It, it kind of got me thinking of just like, uh, forget about the smart TVs or, you know, the phones and people spying on you. The vacuum cleaners have been digging up dirt on you for years. Ooh, but um bump. That was a good one. Right? That was a good one. <laughs> okay, next I'll introduce you to Mojo Lens, a smart lens with an integrated display that gives you updates without interrupting your concentration here on Commando. And of course, no show's complete without you. And our phone lines are open here on the T-Mobile Unlimited Listener Line. The number is one 825 5254 You know, you can Google anything, but you cannot Google my trusted advice. Apps are double-edged swords. They help you get the most out of your phone, but they can be a big drain on your battery. And in today's Commando DIY, we'll show you five popular apps that may be to blame. iPhone users love their devices, but one common problem faced by that pocket-sized box of wonder is that the battery life never outlasts the fun. If your iPhone can't make it the entire day without needing a recharge, then certain apps might be the reason why. And this Commando DIY will give you the five apps and their settings that could be draining your battery. First up is Facebook. In the settings menu, scroll to the Facebook app icon and tap location. In this menu, you can decide when you want Facebook to access your location. Another setting to change is background app refresh. Click on settings and under the general tab, click background app refresh. Scroll down to the Facebook icon and toggle off. Now let's nix those notifications. Tap on settings, then click on notifications. Select the Facebook app and toggle allow notifications off. 
Google Maps is another app that zaps your battery power, so you'll want to change those location and notification settings. Just like you did with Facebook, click on your iPhone settings and scroll to Google Maps. Click on Location, select the option to Ask Next Time. Follow the same steps to get to notifications. Select Google Maps and toggle notifications off. Snapchat could be juicing your battery dry, so try disabling live location. In the Snapchat app, go to Settings, then My Location. Toggle the Ghost Mode option on, and that's it. If you use WhatsApp, disabling notifications can help extend the life of your battery. Go to Settings on your iPhone, select WhatsApp, and toggle off. One final tip for saving your iPhone's battery life could mean switching to a lighter version of Messenger. Yes, there really is an app for that. It's called Messenger Lite. Facebook describes it as its data-efficient messaging app, and you can get it free in the App Store. Battery power is something we could all use a little more of. And with just a few simple steps, you'll be on your way to battery life bliss. To keep your digital know-how going, visit our website, commando.com, where you'll find news, videos, how-tos, and so much more. Augmented reality is on our phones and coming to our cars, but try and imagine seeing AR through your own two eyes. Not with glasses, but with contact lenses. Mojo Vision is a startup that wants to bring advanced AR tech into our lives in a way that was never possible before. And on today's show, we have CEO Drew Perkins and SVP Steve Sinclair here to talk about Mojo Vision. So my first question for you two gentlemen is, how'd you come up with this idea? So a decade ago, roughly, I got uh, cataracts in my eyes and I had cataract surgery. And when they do cataract surgery, they put devices called intraocular lenses into your eyes. And I thought, you know, why in this day and age, that was a decade ago already, can I have uh, bionic vision like the six million dollar man. <laughs> I thought to myself, you know, someday I'm going to start a company to develop that. I'm a serial entrepreneur. The concept of augmented reality was already becoming very popular. I thought, well, obviously it would make sense to both commercially and just from the technology integrate augmented reality capability into it at the same time. And so Drew, what would be some great uses of the smart contact lens? Well, actually I'll, I'll jump in here. So, uh, um, a lot of folks think about augmented reality as a heads-up display and bringing information in front of you. For us, um, it is contextual information. We want to bring up information that's useful in the moment. So imagine you're doing your show and your script is all in front of you, but there are no teleprompters in front of you. You have all the information you need um, available to you. You're a doctor working with a patient and all the patient information you need is there, but you're able to have a conversation with them eye to eye because you don't have something big and bulky on your face. So any kind of important information that you want to see in the moment, um, is useful for, for this kind of application. And then when you don't need it, it goes away. And so would your smartphone be doing most of the processing power then? Some of the processing power is happening on the smartphone. Some of it is happening on an accessory that's helping to pass data to the contact lenses. Um, some of it can be happening in the cloud. Um, and in fact, our smart contact lens actually has a small uh, ARM processor on it as well. How much longer before we would actually see this in the marketplace? So it's probably going to be a few years, um, and we don't want to guess when the FDA is going to give us that approval, but we're working hard to get there. So what do you think is the next milestone for Mojo Vision? So uh, I'll answer that one. I think that, uh, you know, for us, it's continuing to build out the prototypes that we have, um, prove that they do what we want them to do and that they're safe and effective to ourselves before we take them to the FDA for um, clinical trials. We're working very closely um, to build a solution for some of our earliest customers, which are going to be people that have low vision conditions, um, which will allow them to see information in front of them that they otherwise wouldn't be able to see. Uh, so we've been partnering with the Vista Center in Palo Alto, which helps people uh, with low vision and blindness to uh, cope with the conditions that they have. Um, and we believe we can help them by giving them contact lenses that allow them to see things in front of them like the edges of curbs or signs or cars or other obstacles that might be in their path as they're trying to get from place to place. You know what, that's really remarkable. Um, and I'm so glad that you mentioned that because uh, on a personal level, when I was uh, 14 is I had a cornea transplant. Mm. And in my right eye, I, my vision is probably 2250. Mm -hmm. And on my left eye, I have 2020. 
And so quite often, you know, I'll go to grab a glass and I like miss it. <laughs> You know, and people say, oh, gosh, she's drinking again. You know, it's not because you're drinking. It's just because you don't have that 3D perspective. But if, gosh, you know, if your technology could enable people that have various conditions uh, live a normal and fulfilled life, I think that's absolutely phenomenal. Really, that's that's great kudos that's to you guys. That's absolutely our goal. You know, that's sort of our North Star. What we're really trying to do is help people uh, in all walks of life and all uh, different kind of issues that they might have or even help normal people be you know, reach their full potential. Gentlemen, thank you both again for coming on the Kim Commando Show. And I don't know about you, but I'm starting to think it might be worth trading my glasses in for a pair of these smart lenses. Okay, now it's time for your weekly tech trivia question. It's no secret that your phone and the apps on it track everywhere you go. Your smart speakers are listening to you. Social media sites know everything about you. Cameras are everywhere. You used to have to rob a bag to be taped. Back in 1999, one CEO of a big tech company made this bold statement to a group of reporters who were just shocked. He said, you have zero privacy anyway, get over it. Well, which tech company CEO said those words? Was it A, John Chambers from Cisco, B, Carly Fiona from Hewlett Packard, uh, C, Lou Gerstner from IBM, or D, Scott McNeely from Sun Microsystems? Stick around, I'll have the answer at the end of the hour. Time now for a new fun feature on the show that we're calling Tech Blink, a quick look at tech that delivers what you'd never expect. Well, get ready as we present you with four new products. It's up to you to decide whether this new tech will make it or break it, and this is important. How much would you be willing to pay for it? Because in the world of tech, products come and go, and the blink of an eye, and let's get started. Are you ready, Chris? Oh, I'm ready. Okay, well, I'm gonna go first, okay. then, then it's your turn. Okay. Then I'm gonna go. So and you're gonna go. And then I'm gonna go. Yes. Okay. okay. And when you go, I'm gonna I'm gonna guess. Yes, right? you're gonna guess cool. what exactly how much the price is. What would you be willing to spend for oh, this? Now okay. every product exists. You can wow. buy every single this one of these. This is all real. Okay. Yes. Okay. Now and then so how much? And then do you think it's actually going to make it? Okay. Okay. So the first one is did you ever jump rope as a kid? Y yeah. Okay. A lot of people exercise and they still jump rope. But how about the Smart Rope by Tangren? It displays skipping statistics as you jump. And so as you're jumping around, there are 23 LEDs laid out inside the rope that bend along with the rope because of this patent pending flexible PCB on the inside. And so as you're jumping rope is that you see like how many times you've gone. It's gonna be like okay. 101, 102. So you don't have to like think about that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So it's a Smart Rope with an app that will track your health statistics. Yeah. How much would you be willing to spend for this? <laughs> okay, so let me ask you a question then. Will it count how many times you trip and fall? Because I wouldn't want it if it would count how many times you would trip and fall, because it would be every time for me. I it would imagine. probably reset to zero. Okay. Oh, that'd be terrible. <laughs> yeah, so you, back to zero, back to zero, back yeah. to zero. <laughs> it would just kind of be like three and then back to zero. So I don't think I would buy this because, only because I, you go to gyms and there's jump ropes everywhere and I've never seen anybody use it. So if I were to buy it, I'm guessing, uh, is this, am, do I get it right if I'm like within $10, $20? I'll give you five bucks. Five bucks? Okay. Yes, come on. Then I'll be exact. A hundred and three dollars and ten cents. Huh. No. No? Mm. Seventy-eight dollars and ninety-five cents. Oh. Okay. I'm not seeing a big future. Okay, you're up. Okay, so we had talked last week about my beard. So I, I happen to find a product that's beard related. It's called Man Mower. The Man Mower. The wacky, innovative stubble shaver inspired by the lawn mower. Okay, so the, the man mower is one of those, uh, just in my opinion, pretty ludicrous products uh, that's also sheer genius, if you will. Conceptually, it's a lawn mower uh, for your jawline. An internal blade slices away at your facial hair, leaving just a casual stubble behind, just like the lawnmower slices the grass in your lawn to a short uniform length. Uh, there's no water needed, no shaving cream needed, no electricity. So this you, little thing just goes up and down? Yeah, it's just this like kind of cylinder looking thing and then you can put it in your pocket and pull it out anytime. So you could technically do it in public, but that would be weird. Yeah, um, that'd be weird. Yeah. Um, I would say $34.95. Wow, very close. 
Yeah, sort of. It's, it's no, it's it's not. It's fifty nine pounds in the UK because it's over oh, in the UK. Oh, I should have said pounds. Ah, yeah. I should I should have warned you. That's okay. But if we did it in dollars, it'd be seventy five. Oh, so. I would not pay seventy five dollars for that, even I, if I had a beard. Yeah, I, I wouldn't. So I don't think it's going to make it. No, no, not going to make it. Okay. This one is pretty bizarre to me because okay. how many photos do you have on your phone? Uh, like a thousand. Okay, I have 26,000. Really? Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, Maybe I have more than. I think you have more than that. <laughs> I must have more than But that. I'm older than you, so I probably have more. <laughs> okay, so uh, how many have you actually printed? Two. Okay. I think I've probably printed two or three, too. Oh, okay. Okay, but here's what we have now. It's called the Impossible Instant Lab. Again, this is a real product. Basically, what you do is you pull up the photo on your phone, yeah. okay, that you'd like to print. And then it has this, it, this instant photo lab has paper in it and everything else that it takes to print. So you place your phone on this instant printer that looks like an old-fashioned camera Wow. You hit a button, and then in like a minute, you have a picture that pops out of this thing. Oh. And it kind of looks like a Polaroid. So they're kind of going after the Polaroid yeah. Instant Lab. So how much? Okay, so I actually like this product a lot. Do you? Oh, yeah. It, it makes it in my mind. Like, I think that this is genius. My wife takes Polaroid pictures all the time. She wanted one for Christmas, so we got her. And any event we go to, she'll take the Polaroid picture, we'll stand, watch the sun <laughs> thing. Like, it's crazy. Like, we try to make sure that the picture looks good. So I would do this. I would get this for her, um, hands down. So I'm thinking... 300 bucks. Wow. Yeah, Polaroids really? can get expensive. So I'd put okay. it at three. You know what? That's, it's $195. Uh, yeah. Okay, so final one. Okay, I think that this is crazy. Um, it's called the, the Peleg Pelican. It's the only bird allowed in your kitchen. The Peg Leg Pelican? Yeah, pe Peleg Pelican. Oh, oh okay. I'm and, like Peg Leg. What the oh, I see. Okay, I understand. I see the picture now. Yes, and just like you, I really like the description, so I'm, I'm going to read this. I, I didn't write this, but I think it was so funny, and it's worth the read. I love to cook, whoever wrote this, but I hate to do the dishes after. The soaking dishes, the wet cloth, the soapy sponge, it's all so damp. Designer Gil Cohen has created uh, Pelix for Peleg Design, a cute kitchen companion that will reduce your internal shrieks and actually lift your mood while doing dishes. This little pelican-shaped cloth and sponge holder will be perched on your counter, and the only thing okay. that will fly I, I would is buy, time. I would buy that. Really? It probably, it's like, you know, like the salt and pepper shaker that yeah. you have, that you bought because it was cute, and then you used it for a week. And yeah. Uh, $14.99. $14.99. Let's see if you're right. $15. Whoa! $15. But but listen, before you say that it's for sure like a make it uh, product, this is the last line of this whole thing. It says, that is why it's called a pelican, not a pelicant. And I just, uh, I think, you know, there yeah. it goes at that point. So all products <laughs> are absolutely real. They exist. And in case you'd like to buy one for yourself, just hit commando.com. Head over to K-O-M-A-N-D-O.com and when you're there, Hit that link at the top that says Kim Show. He has moves like Jagger, and he's hitting the road. Could she mind be coming to a music venue near you? Your Tomorrow's Tech today is just minutes away, and it's only on Commando. Tech moves at lightning speed, and I love to go past the headlines to tell you where the future's headed. And this week, let's start with drones. I am sure you've seen them in all shapes and sizes, but I bet you haven't seen a future tech drone quite like this one. It's the world's first manned aerobatic drone, emphasis on the word aerobatic, and it's built like a Formula One race car. This 12-rotor multi-copter had its maiden flight in Croatia, and it can flip, roll, and loop, you name it. It's also fast, able to hit up to 90 miles per hour. Now, you might ask the question, if it's manned, then how is it a drone? That's not a pilot seat, it's for a passenger. This craft is being controlled by a real pilot on the ground. This big drone, as it's being called, was built by Drone Champions AG to promote the Drone Champions League video game. Finally, a video game that might actually make your kids put down that controller and go pick one up in the real world. Okay, another day, another electric concept car. This future car is worth paying attention to because the words Volvo and style haven't always gone together. This is the Polestar Precept. Polestar is a sub-brand of Volvo. At the front of the car, in place of a grill, there are two radar sensors. 
a LiDAR system, and an HD camera that constantly feeds information to the car's systems. And those aren't actually side mirrors, they're cameras. Inside, there's no rear view mirror, just a video screen for the rear facing camera. On top, a panoramic glass roof, then into the cabin where there's a 15 inch touchscreen, another 12 and an inch display for the driver powered by Google's Android Automotive OS. Eye tracking tech monitors where the driver's looking and adjusts the displays accordingly, such as brightness level. Look at the screen too long and the car will give you a, hey, eyes up here warning. Some of the interior is made from recyclable products. The seats, they're woven from recycled bottles. The headrests are made of recycled cork vinyl. Then there's the carpet, which is made from recycled fishing nets. Maybe one day you can buy this car from Neil Diamond on eBay. It'll be called Sweet Car Online. All right, I tried really hard with that one. Uh, virtual reality and augmented reality are typically associated with gaming. But this tech is also becoming more common in other fields. You'll find AR and maps on your phone or heads up displays in your car. And now two AR startups are teaming up to create better virtual future workplaces than what already exists. The AR software you're seeing is made by a company named Spatial. And I'm talking about a sophisticated holographic collaboration tool. 3D avatars of real people are created from 2D photos, endless ways to move and manipulate digital files and virtual whiteboards. Before, the software was often used with Microsoft HoloLens bulky $2,500 headset. Now here comes the N real light, which aren't much bigger than sunglasses, and they only cost 500 bucks. No bulk because a smartphone does all the heavy lifting, connecting to the AR glasses via cable. But enough about the details and the price. If you create a world full of AR and VR, is it virtually limitless? There may be music or a star into your mind. I clear this magic room. What you're hearing is music by Shimon that's about to release its very first album and go on tour. Oh, and did I mention that Shimon is a musical robot? Take a look at this future tech musical prodigy that kind of resembles a large metal insect. Shimon was created by a Georgia Tech professor and first hit the scene a few years ago as a simple marimba playing robot that could improvise music in a limited way. That was a long time ago in robot years, and now Shimon is much more advanced. Now the musical robot can create melodies, write lyrics, sing, and even dance. All Shimon needs is a theme, then it begins working on a song from there, collaborating with real people. Its creator wants to stress that robots aren't intended to replace human musicians. The tech is instead meant to help real artists generate ideas and broaden the way they think about music. So Shimon is going on tour and performing live concerts. But it's a missed opportunity if Shimon doesn't record a cover of Mr. Roboto. All right, my next guest knows the highs and lows of being a game designer. Howard Scott Warshaw created the best-selling video games for Atari, and I'll speak with him here on Commando. Back in the 1980s, one video game did so poorly that it was blamed for tanking the entire industry. This was the E.T. video game based on the movie and designed by the creator of Yars Revenge, one of the greatest games of all time. And now he's here with us in the studio to share his experiences about life gaming and his time at Atari. Please welcome Howard Scott Warshaw to the show. And Howard, it's great to have you with us. And just a quick question, what was it like designing games in the 80s? What was that environment like? Uh, that environment was amazing. It was just perfect in a lot of ways because we had total creative freedom. We could do whatever we wanted to do. We could change direction if we needed to. Today, game making is so monolithic. It's huge. Uh, the way I compare it is that nowadays making a game is like a cruise ship. And a cruise ship is a wonderful place. You can have a lot of fun. You can do a lot of great things on it. But one thing you can't do on a cruise ship is change direction quickly. <laughs> back, back then, it was like working on a speedboat. And that has a very different kind of feel to it that I really enjoyed. So were the games more just shoot them up, as I remember, or just getting like to get to the next level? Whereas I think like today's games, they seem to have a big storyline behind it. 
Well, that's an excellent point. I mean, nowadays you have more specific genres of game. There's only a few genres. They're very big. They're very involved. Back then, uh, we were establishing genres. One of the greatest things about doing games back then was we were the pioneers of a new industry, right? It was a new medium. And so our goal wasn't to elaborate or do something huge or enormous that people are already familiar with. Our job was to create something new that nobody knew existed before then. Okay, so if you came up with an idea like Yar's Revenge, how did that happen? Well, Yar's Revenge was originally assigned as a coin-op game called Star Castle. And I looked that game over. I'd only been there a few days. I'd read a couple of manuals and I looked the game over and I went to my manager and I said, you know, this game is going to suck. It's my <laughs> first game, and I cannot afford to have my first game suck, so please let me do something else with it. And I propose an alternate game design that went on to become Yar's Revenge, although it wasn't Yar's Revenge till the very end. It's actually kind of an interesting story of how, it, how the naming came about, but it was a fully developed game before it ever got a name or a concept. I had read something that Yar was actually Ray, Backwards? Is that what it was? Exactly. Yeah, it was uh, Ray Kazar was the CEO of the company. So when I came up with the uh, with the naming idea for the game, I, I wanted to put something I could get through marketing. And so I decided what I'll do is I'll make it a play on the name of the CEO of the company, and then probably no one will argue with it. And then I decided, well. So I don't do things in a small way, typically. So since I, I didn't want to just come up with a name, so I actually wrote the first backstory in video game history to support the name, because I figured a name and a story would be stronger than just a name. That game obviously was wildly successful. How many units did it actually sell? Well over a million. In fact, every single game that I did, including the Notorious E.T., <laughs> sold well over a million units. I think I'm the only programmer who every game they did and released sold a million. You did Yars Revenge. Okay, you're like the golden child, and now it comes time for Raiders of the Lost Ark. Indeed. That was really fun because I had to fly down to uh, L.A. and meet Steven Spielberg at uh, Warner Studios and interview to do the game. You had to be approved by Spielberg to do uh, one of the Spielberg titles. I think the thing that got me the game, I showed him Yars Revenge and he really enjoyed that. We had a nice chat about gaming and he really enjoys games. But I think the thing that really got me the opportunity to do the game was the fact that I called him an alien and explained to him how I figured he was an alien. <laughs> You know what? That must be a great story. So Raiders of the Lost Ark, how long did it take for you to create that game? That was the longest game I ever worked on. That game took 10 full months. Wow. Yars, Yars Revenge took about seven months. You do Raiders of the Lost Ark and then that too becomes a home run? It did very well. Another million seller. It was one of the first, uh, I think it was the first ever game from a movie. And now the next Spielberg hit comes, E.T. the movie. E.T. the movie. Here and, we go. <laughs> and so your approach to say, okay, come on, you can do this game. We know you can. And so do you have to go back and meet Steven Spielberg again? He requested that I do the game. But oh. it wasn't so much that I got to do the E.T. video game. The truth is I was the only person who was willing to take on the task of doing the E.T. game. Because when the game came up, you know, I told you it was like seven months for my first game, 10 months for my second game. Most games back then took at least six months to make. The schedule only allowed for five weeks to do the E.T. video game. No one else would touch it. I know because I offered it. <laughs> five weeks to do a complete game? five weeks. Did you sleep? Some. I found a way to try to use sleep to my advantage. I wanted to make my sleep time a part of my productivity. You know, sometimes we dream up solutions. I tried to put that to work for me. But what I did was uh, I had a development station moved into my home. Wow. The game comes out, E.T., and it wasn't quite the success that anybody had dreamed. You could put it that way. Or you could say there was an outrageous backlash because people hated the game. <laughs> you could say that, too. I'm not very sensitive about it. Tell you the truth, E.T. has always felt like an enormous success to me. It made it all the way through. It was a solid game. It was a full game. 
Uh, it just wasn't tuned, but I succeeded in delivering a, a saleable title in five weeks, which was a pretty remarkable feat. Tell us about what happened and why did the gaming cartridges have to be buried in New Mexico and supposedly covered up with a concrete block? Great question. Great question. Why did they have to do that? So it's hard to understand why a company that's really in dire straits and failing financially needs to spend the extra money to take supposedly worthless product and go ship it way out of the desert, bury it, crush it, and then cement it over. Like, think of all the Teamster hours involved in an operation <laughs> like that. So that's kind of crazy. But what they were doing was actually not getting rid of all the ET cards. They were getting rid of, uh, they were clearing out a warehouse. And so there were ET cards, there were other kinds of cards, there was all kinds of uh, equipment and games that were buried there. The reason they cemented it over was because they found when they started dumping those things, word had gotten out and kids were coming in and uh, I guess dump robbing, right? <laughs> it would be the term for it. Uh, a lot of people were coming and trying to steal stuff out of the dump. And so they needed to uh, cement it over to reduce the temptation of people to come in and try and grab stuff which is an unusual situation for a dump to be in, I guess. Uh, yeah, I found the whole story kind of fascinating from uh, a novel perspective. Like, again, like, I'm not really quite sure we had to take these type of extremes. You have a book coming out. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, the book I'm writing is called Once Upon Atari, and it's the story of how uh, I impacted Atari, because I obviously did some notorious as well as uh, well-established uh, titles for Atari. But it's also the story of how Atari impacted me in my life, which still goes on. You know, the fact that we're talking today is something that Atari did in my life. And uh, it's really been an amazing journey. It's been an unbelievable trip. And the highs and the lows, Atari was, uh, it was the most unbelievable place to work. It wasn't always the super joyful place to work, but it was, it was an experiment, what I would call ecstatic intensity. <laughs> if you really like intensity, high intensity stuff, where some days you can blow the roof off and think you're really on top of the world, and another days you wouldn't know if you were still going to have a job by the end of the day. Both of those kind of days occurred on a semi-regular basis at Atari, and you never knew which one was coming next. It was a wild place to work. Well, Howard, you're an amazing guy, and I personally look forward to reading your book. And thanks for coming on the Kim Commando Show today. It just goes to show you that it's not just all fun and games in the gaming industry. It's super serious business. Okay, now back to the trivia question I asked you earlier. Which tech company CEO said way back in 1999, you have zero privacy anyway, get over it? Was it A, John Chambers from Cisco, B, Carly Friona from Hewlett Packard, C, Lou Gerstner from IBM, or D, Scott McNeely from Sun Microsystems? And the answer is D, Scott McNeely from Sun Microsystems, who called consumer privacy issues a, quote, red herring. He told the group of reporters, you have zero privacy anyway and get over it. It seemed shocking then, but fast forward 20 years, and it's exactly as he turns out, he was right. But even Scott didn't predict that we'd give up our privacy for free flashlight apps, a smart speaker, or a personality quiz on Facebook. All right, it's time now for our digital life hack, and every week we put one of these together. And I'm gonna preface this week's with just a little comment that it's better to be prepared than to panic because the coronavirus outbreak continues to make its way across the globe as health officials are urging everyone to be more vigilant and to prepare for the possibility of more cases. So should you prepare for the coronavirus? Yes. What does the spread of the virus mean to your business, your data, your family? It's all about being proactive and starting with something called process mapping. We've done this here at the Kim Commando Show Studios and Jeremy in our IT department is amazing. He came to me and said, Kim, we have to do process mapping. And I was like, what is that? And process mapping is where employees, they have written guidelines and instructions that allow them to act in other roles of the business. So if you work in publication, you could process map the copy editing process so that potentially a writer could do that role without missing a beat. And we've got more information about this. Very important step for any size business on our website. Number two, you wanna stay informed, you wanna ignore the news. If you're looking for accurate, up-to-date way to track the spread of the illness, we've got a map from John Hopkins University. 
and we've posted over at commando.com. You know, be skeptical of what you see on Facebook, please, and stop passing it and sharing it. And then I wanted to put together some work at home options for you. You want to look at software suites like G Suites or Office 365, because this way your workers can actually be at home. There's 14 day free trials. It also has two factor authentication. It costs $6 a month for Google. And then if you're looking at Microsoft Office 365, it's $8.25. Number four, secure your data all across the board. You wanna make sure that you're using things like VPNs and password managers and that people are able to access things. You wanna search for the report on our site called How to Prepare Your Business for the Coronavirus. That's where we have detailed step-by-step instructions on setting up the security for your Windows and Mac. Then finally, virtual meetings. Let's say, for example, some people are sick, they're at home, maybe they've been uh, quarantined in their community. How do you make that magic happen? There are services like Zoom and Skype and Slack that will keep your business going. And again, my intention is not to go ahead and instill panic on you. I want you to be prepared. All right, it's time now for our DIY security tip. And gone are the days of standing in line at the bank because now we can just grab our phones and fire up an app to move money around. It's estimated that more than 160 million Americans now use digital banking services. And it's great, but what happens when a hacker jumps into the mix? Making financial transactions online can open the door to some potentially nasty side effects. And if you don't take proper steps, cyber criminals can take advantage of you and weak security and crack into your accounts. So you can bank online safely. Let's start at the beginning. Two-factor authentication, okay? If you access your bank online via an app or web login, 2FA is probably available as a security option. What you want to do is make sure that you set it all up. Number two is you might have a actual physical key. Now, whether or not your bank actually gives you this, it's up to that bank. It's called sometimes called a physical security token. Like for example, HSBC Bank offers a security device that generates codes for you to enter online. And I have the same thing from another bank. Now, again, not all banks offer these physical tokens or keys, so ask if your does. Now, I also want you to be careful of any type of public Wi-Fi. You need to be using a VPN. If you're on your iPhone, we're gonna tell you how to make sure you set up your screen for those options as well as on an Android. And if you're on public Wi-Fi, just know those aren't the only ones that get compromised. At a hotel, anybody can tap into you. And next, I want you to be really careful of when you need help, do not just Google a tech support phone number. What you wanna do is look for the number on the back of your debit or credit card or the help or support section of your bank's smartphone app. And also you wanna make sure that you're not leaving yourself open. On your bank's app or website, I know it's kind of a hassle, but make sure that you always log off or sign out before exiting. Uh, you wanna close your browser window, make sure the program's closed as well. On Macs and Androids, we have some steps that you definitely want to take. And they're all detailed for you over on the website. Head over to commando.com, of course. That's K-O-M-A-N-D-O.com. And when you're there, click the link that says Kim Show. Standby control. Q Kim. A TV reporter in Asheville, North Carolina, didn't realize that his Facebook live feed was using filters that made his report, well, especially awesome. I'll explain next on Commando. Many television stations in small to medium-sized towns now hire what those of us in the industry call one-man bands. These are television reporters who do it all, from hosting the segments to recording and editing what you see on the air. WLOS ABC 13 anchor Justin Hinton recently fired up Facebook Live on his phone for his weather broadcast in Asheville, North Carolina, about the city's first real snowfall. Just a little problem. Justin forgot to turn off Facebook's live mystery mask augmented reality filter for his entire broadcast about the dangers that snow was presenting on the roads where there hadn't been such an event for two years. Justin, the esteemed reporter, wore a space helmet or had giant googly eyes. And the best was what looked like something from the Broadway show and movie Cats. The moral of the story is simple. Before you go live at home or for work, do a test. Otherwise, you might look like a flake. I really appreciate you being here and stick with me for your trusted digital know-how. Find your local radio station that broadcasts my show, along with more DIY how-tos, videos, free news alerts delivered from me to your email address, along with the Commando community, where you can blog and ask your tech questions on our website without anyone tracking you. That's commando.com. And thanks so much for watching.